What's up, everybody? This is an updated video on respiratory acidosis. So if you watch this video before and you're like, wait, why is this popping up as new again? Or listen to this podcast before and been like, why is popping up as new again? It's because I had to update it. So let's get into it with some updated and correct information. So um, with respiratory acidosis, what we're going to see is acidemia in the blood. So remember our normal blood pH is between 7.35 and 7.45. So if we see any pH that's outside of those range, we're either going to have alkalosis where it's higher, more alkaline, or acidosis where it's lower. So the important thing to remember is if the pH is less than 7.5, we're going to see respiratory acidosis. And so even though like seven is technically not acidic, it's acidic, it's acidic in comparison to the normal range of blood pH. So this is going to affect the lungs. Um, and so the lungs are going to affect the blood based on this. So that's why it's respiratory acidosis. So etiology. So we're going to see this happen a lot with obstructive lung diseases. Now, there are some types of restrictive lung diseases that can cause this, such as when that's paralyzed um, or um, due to like a decrease in the like area and space of the lungs. However, when it comes to understanding what are pathologies that cause respiratory acidosis, these are mainly going to be our obstructive lung diseases. So I want you guys to associate obstructive lung diseases with respiratory acidosis. Why is this? Because with obstructive lung diseases, it's difficulty getting air out. Obstructive is air out. We can't get air out. So if we can't get air out, CO2 is going to build up in the body, build up in the blood. That CO2 is what causes the uh, blood pH to tank down. So some types of obstructive lung diseases that cause this are COPD, asthma, and emphysema. Now, these other conditions that can cause this are conditions that paralyze the muscles of inspiration. Now, could these technically be considered restrictive lung diseases? Yes, because we can't use as much lung space. However, when it comes to what conditions will cause respiratory acidosis, um, conditions that can cause this are muscle are where the muscles of inspiration are paralyzed. So we're thinking Guillain-Barre and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, those are going to paralyze our um, skeletal muscles. So what is a skeletal muscle we don't want paralyzed? That is our diaphragm. So we're going to see if the diaphragm cannot contract and pull the lungs down, what's going to happen is, first of all, we'll have a decrease in the amount of ability for the lungs to expand. However, we will also have a decrease in the ability for the muscles of inspiration to even contract. This is going to result in hypoventilation. So if it's a weak contraction or slow contraction or not as frequent contraction as what happens with Guillain-Barre syndrome and ALS, we're going to see hypoventilation, so a low respiratory rate, which is what's going to cause the buildup of CO2 in the lungs. So if we can't get our air in, or no, we're getting our air in, if we can't uh, clear that air out, because we have this low respiratory rate. So think of like if you breathe really, really slowly during those like meditation exercises that are like you breathe in, you hold it, you breathe out. Like by the end of it, you're like, oh my gosh, you're trying to clear it out to get back to normal. These people cannot clear the air out by hyperventilating. So they're stuck hypoventilating and the CO2 just keeps building and building and building and building. And so that results in hypercapnia. So what's, I know this is really confusing. You might have to watch this a couple of times, but with hypercapnia, so hyper meaning high, capnia being CO2, this means an increase in CO2 because we can't get the air out. We're stuck. That CO2 is just building up and building up and building up with all of these pathologies. And so what's going to happen is our CO2 levels begin to rise. As our CO2 levels begin to rise, they get out of that normal range of 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. It's kind of convenient for CO2 because that's 7.35, 7.45, and then 35 to 45. All those numbers are the same. Um, for our normal ranges. So that helps me remember. So if we're having a high level of partial pressure of CO2, what's happening is that um, the CO2 levels are rising. We have CO2 floating around rising. What's going to happen? I know this is boring chemistry. It's going to combine with like the hydrogen ions and create carbonic acid. And that is why our acid uh, levels start to increase. Like that, so why our pH starts to tank and become more acidic because we're literally through all these processes of having all the CO2 building up, we're causing it to create carbonic acid when it bonds with hydrogen ions in the blood. And that is why our pH starts to go down. So 
listen to that a couple times and then I hope that that kind of clicks. This is a hard one. This is why I had to redo this one because um, I feel like now I have a better understanding of what's going on to be able to explain this. So what does it look like? So we're going to see hypercapnia, so an increase in CO2 levels, hypoventilation, so low ventilation level rate. So remember normal is like 12 to 20 breaths per minute. The patient's going to present with a cyanosis. So this is a big one. They're going to become cyanotic, which they start turning blue. And so we'll see the cyanosis like in the digits and everything like that. Um, they're going to have a confused altered mental status. They're going to be like, I'm not sure where I'm at. And that's just like the big thing where it's like new onset of confusion where you're like, okay, something's wrong. Like, is it a UTI or is it going to be like something really bad? So you got to kind of take it all in cont to consideration. You're going to see acidemia. So remember that it's a blood pH that is below 7.35 and the patient's going to become lethargic because um, they're having all the acid buildup in their blood. So how are we treating it? So we are referring out to have this patient stabilized. Um, if it's an acute respiratory acidosis situation that is considered a medical emergency, they need to go straight to the ER. It's above our main grade. Um, in physical therapy, what we're doing is we're going to be monitoring their vital signs, you know, taking SpO2 levels. Um, if they have the ability to get blood arterial gas levels in an acute care setting, we're going to be looking into those as well. Just kind of monitoring everything. If anything is looking a little sus towards respiratory acidosis or alkalosis, then we're like, hmm. Should probably call somebody about that. However, mainly if we have this patient, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be just treating whatever condition they came in with. So the COPD, emphysema, obesity, do they have GBS, ALS, like whatever they're already in for, like we're just going to be working with them on that because that's that's what we do. We can we can treat those deficits when it comes to physical deficits, when it comes to all this systemic stuff. That's where we have a multi like interdisciplinary team working with the patient. So keywords associated with respiratory acidosis, the boards is more going to be asking you, like they'll present the condition and be like, is this acidosis or alkalosis? Is it respiratory or metabolic? And that's literally how they will start uh, describing it. Or like, what is a patient that would be most likely to be associated with this condition? Um, so we'll see that as well. So hypercapnia. So that's when we're going to see a high level of CO2 in the blood, which is going to cause the blood pH to be less than 7.35, which is acidemia. They're going to have hypo. Uh, with an O ventilation, so low respiratory rate levels because they um cannot get air uh, out of the lungs. So they're just breathing really slowly, either their paralysis or um, the fact that they just can't get air in. Um, you see it with obstructive lung diseases. So even those that can't can breathe faster to try to compensate, what ends up happening is they just can't get air out. So that's why we're seeing just the low ventilation level and then paralysis of any muscles of inspiration associated with ALS guillain -Bray, all that stuff. Cyanosis, so turning blue. Um, and then we're going to see a confused altered mental status with these patients due to the acid levels starting to creep up in their blood, like affecting everything. So these are the big things that we're going to see with associated with respiratory acidosis. So Sample question. A physical therapist assistant is treating a patient in the clinic with emphysema. Recently, the patient reports she has been forgetting where she is when go driving to work and has missed a few shifts. The patient also notes her fingers have been turning blue. Based on the clinical presentation of this patient, what lab values would we expect to see? So we have um, blood pH of 7.5, blood pH of 7.4, partial pressure of CO2 of 60 millimeters of mercury, or a partial pressure of CO2 of 40 millimeters of mercury. So I'll give you guys a second to think about this question. All right, guys, so the answer is a partial pressure of CO2 of 60 millimeters of mercury. So let's break this down. Um, they didn't tell us that this patient had respiratory acidosis. We kind of had to start figuring it out. So emphysema, obstructive lung disease, forgetting where she's at. So altered mental status, missed a few shifts. Her fingers are turning blue. So we got cyanosis, we got an obstructive lung disease, and we got altered mental status. So because of this, this is all, you know, those the board's going to give you usually like three things that will point towards the pathology if they don't say it. All right, so this is definitely going to be respiratory acidosis. So let's look at these. Um, first of all, let's look at this partial pressure of CO2 of 40. What's our normal range? It's going to be 35 to 40, so uh, to 45. So 35 to 45. Um, so 40 
would be in that normal range. So generally, if the value is normal, but something's going wrong with the patient, we can get rid of that answer. Um, so this is within normal range. So let's get rid of it because our answer is actually going to be the partial pressure of CO2 is too high, which is causing, you know, the increase in like merging together to make carbonic acid, to make it acidotic. Um, and due to the fact that we're having cyanosis and all of this stuff, emphysema, it's all leading towards our respiratory acidosis, which is characterized by high partial pressure of CO2. But let's look at the other two answers just to make sure we know why they're wrong. So blood pH is 7.5. That is insanely high. Um, I know it said like, there's like little differences in everything. That's really, really alkalotic. So this is the situation that's in the questions describing your respiratory acidosis. This blood pH of 7.5 is respiratory alkalosis so alkaline with a k wrong not our thing we can get rid of that and then blood ph of 7.4 remember our normal range is 7.435 7.45 again this is another example of the um blood ph is within normal range so that means it's not the answer because um we're having we would need to be seeing a, bl a blood ph of 7.33 or something like that and being like mm, yep that's that's acidosis. All right, guys, I hope that this was helpful in explaining respiratory acidosis. It does get really confusing. If you have any questions, please contact me. This one is a doozy. So take care. Have a great rest of your day.